Thank you once again for tuning in to the Dancing Sober podcast. I want to thank my sponsor, Movita Juice Bar. Go to movitajuicebar.com to see their locations, and you could also order them through Uber Eats, etc., things like that. Today's guest, Mario Ibarra Jr. from Wilmas, California. He is a multi-faceted artist, just does so many things, and has a lot of really good words of inspiration for us. So, um, without further to do, let's get this one started. Welcome once again to the Dancing Sober podcast, and um, this is our third episode. We're just going to keep it going, and today I'm wearing the cool shirt language because our guest today is Mr. Mario Ibarra Jr. Yep. This man has done so many different things, and let me get this right. You, you're a graduate from Otis? Yes. And you also taught at Otis? Yes. And, and also UCLA, right? Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, we're doing this episode off the cuff, so Mario just... <laughs> yeah, no, like, yeah, my name is Mario Ibarra Jr. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Rafa, for having me, Mr. Cardenas. Um, it's yeah. an honor, brother. Oh, man, it's it's an honor, honor. To be here, honor to be here with you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so my name is Mario Ibarra Jr. That's the preferred one, or Mario Ibarra Jr. That's kind of like the <laughs> second preferred one. The third one, but the one I really don't like is the Mario Wabera Jr. <laughs> Mario Wabera. That was like my ninth grade English teacher. That's how she said oh, it. Oh, good. That one's like somebody scratching the chalkboard like, yeah. <laughs> Mario Wabera Jr., please sit down. Mario Wabera Jr., please be quiet. Oh, that one gets me. But Mario and Mario is cool. When, when I was in the fourth grade, my teacher changed my name from Rafael to Ralph. Oh, Ralph. So I was Ralph until I graduated from high school. Yeah, yeah. That's that. Yeah. That's that. You're you're at the cusp of the generation where they oh, yeah. would do that. Yeah, because my parents, of course, you know, like my mom is Laura. She became Lori. Yeah. You know, and then my, my tío was Guillermo and he yeah, was yeah, Bill. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So like kind of at that cusp where things kind of were, were like that and and just generation. Yeah. We're like an interlinking generation. I say I say I'm a I'm a preemie. And people are like, yeah. how do you mean you're a premium? I'm like, I'm a premillennial, cabron. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to roll with that one. Gen, you're Gen X, right? Gen Just X, like G, yeah. yeah, Gen yeah. X, fully hip hop, yeah. hip hop and grunge. Yeah, we were born before hip hop, you know, yeah, and like we yeah, grew up yeah. with it the whole yeah, time. Yeah, that, that's, that's a big experience for me. I was just talking to somebody the other day because luckily, you know, we're really blessed and people are interested in how we, we've been able to do things and how I've been able to do things over my career and uh, so the Smithsonian has been interviewing me over the past few weeks what? and trying to get my life history and all this. What? And I was telling them about hip hop and how hip hop was really important to my forming. Me too. Because bro. there was yes. Because hip hop was about I know p punk rock has also the same feeling where like you had to make it because mm. there was nothing that fit for you mm. and you had to make it and hip hop was similar like you know like now we could go to the mall and buy hip hop t-shirts yeah. or right now all the people that are going to Melrose and buying those yeah. kind of vintage t-shirts and all that <laughs> but like a few and from our generation you had to go make it like yeah. you had to go to the airbrush the airbrush dude at the swap meet yeah. if you wanted something cool yeah. <laughs> or get the press on letters for something yeah. cool or or just like by hand make it you know? and when there would be a new album or something like there would be just one creative records that said hip-hop <laughs> yeah, yeah. To get the I, new I, was, one. I was trying to explain to them like I think it's really important like uh, as people growing up here in Los Angeles, we were just talking about the different areas of Los Angeles that we have grew up in or the Southern California. But here in, in L.A., the, the person that really distributed a lot of hip hop albums out into the world was a Japanese man from Montebello. His mm. name was Steve Yano. Wow. And Steve Yano and his wife, they used to have a little... Um, a little stand like you're saying yeah. at the rhodium flea market at swap me and huge. The, bro he just had like two crates of hip-hop records wow. and they were like a white label like one yeah, that they yeah, would yeah, yeah, mix yeah. on and i remember um him going there when i was a kid and seeing like dr dre digging through like those one wow. or two crates because he used to make the mixtapes wow but that man was a visionary because he saw or i've been talking about to a few of my mentees like this notion of the gap or the mm. spaces where we could fit in, right? Or a space where you could fit in to kind of pull something out to turn into something. Mm. And um, that man saw that, that 
that there was a scarcity of being able to buy hip hop records. Mm. So, but he was distributing them, so he would get all the new hip hop records. Mm. And then he was smart enough to break bread with somebody like Dr. Dre and pay him, I don't know what he paid him, but commission him to make the mixtapes. Mm. So then a 10 year old kid like me can go buy yeah. a mixtape of all the new songs. And, yeah. um, and I, I grew up gap. in East LA and like the rhodium was like something that I heard like from legends and stuff. I yeah. never got to go to it myself, Yeah, but it was part of like the, the lore back day. Of, like yeah, people yeah. talked about hip hop. It was part of the rhodium. culture. Yeah. That, that's one thing that I feel like was really important and it still continues to be important is that like brown folks have been creating kind of culture here in contemporary culture forever and we've been part of every kind of development yeah. and anything especially in like a place like Los Angeles where we've had our hands and everything so there was brown dudes like in, you know heavy metal bands yeah fool, there was brown dudes in heavy metal bands like oh what you guys listen to heavy metal yeah cabrón they listen to heavy metal <laughs> yeah. there were brown punk a, rockers yeah there were brown punk, punkers yeah. fucker like there's everything, brown yeah. everything yeah, yeah. brown in every hand brown comedians brown movie stars brown yeah, yeah. everything and I think that one of the things that's important for me to always be remembering is like yeah like we're doing something right now like right now our conversation is creating culture yeah. because culture is created of the habits you do daily like yeah. the habits you do daily eventually turn into culture okay so the the more and more we're practicing getting to get together and talk to share histories to share ideas we're creating culture yeah speaking of hip-hop and how hip-hop continues to change and 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 evolve and all these years and it still exists and it's still growing and it's still changing and it's always something different i see you that way too like you're constantly like you've been in different worlds within the art world within the art communities and not only the the um academic side but uh, just the street side too like like you can have a show that's like totally street put up by friends and stuff and you can have a show that's like you know at a yeah, yeah. You've been represented by galleries and all this stuff too, yeah, right? Yeah. So Well, I, I think it's also like coming, I was telling this, the Smithsonian the other day, and I think this is kind of where it comes from. Mm. Because, uh, so I grew up down in the Harbor area. I grew up in Wilmington. And it's pretty, it's an old school barrio. Just Wilmas, like, yeah, yeah, Wilmas. And it's old school barrio. We have an old Catholic church. The lady sells tamales on Sunday. Like, it's a barrio, right? Yeah. And, um, and it's an old school, you know, gang barrio too and all this. So it has all those things. And, um, but I think for me, as I grew up there during the regular school year, and then I would go with my mom to visit my family in Mexico, and they lived in Mexico City. So I, I, my, my notion of Mexico when I was growing up like that was the city. I didn't see it like other people saw it as a rancho, and they were mm. going back to their rancho and mm. to like what you would think mm. of, like, you know, horses and small villages. Yeah, if I went back to where I was born, it's a rancho. It's yeah, a rancho. Yeah. Like, so for me, going back to there with my great-grandparents' house and with being all my, with all my tios and tias and cousins, it was a city. It looked like the city. So you were up it was like they lived across the street from a freeway, bro. <laughs> it was like, Ur! Uh, like big old trailers <laughs> passing by and you had to like cross like risking death just across uh, yeah. to go to the, the little mercadito <laughs> on the other side it was like it was like full on uh, 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 like uh, all yeah. this noise but then my dad he worked in the shipyards down here in Long Beach and um, at a certain point he was a welder when Ooh. he and then he decided he was going to go to junior college and get a degree in drafting. So he has mm. like a associate's degree in drafting because he was like he would get the plans to make the things and he would be like, man, I could do this. Yeah. But when he was in high school, you know, with that generation, Lori to La Laura to Lori and mm. Guillermo to Bill, mm -hmm. like they never pushed that. Oh, he could be an artist or he could go into yeah. an art field. So he's a welder. You go be a welder. OK, yeah. so he did that. He went to be a welder. But when he would get the plans for the things he was making. Yeah. He would be like, oh, man, I could do this job and not have to be like yeah. flipping up my, you know, my welder's helmet all day. So he did that. But then the the, the Navy left here, Long Beach area, and, and he had to move with the jobs. And he went to Mississippi. He went to Biloxi, Mississippi, wow. in, like in the 80s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. So in the summer times, I would go out to Mississippi. Oh, mm -hmm. bro, you think about as, so we, we would fly out from LAX. I would open the, the, my dad would pick us up in New Orleans because I guess that's where the big airport was. Right, he picked us up. As soon as the doors opened, me and my me and my cousin would go out. We'd be like, oh no, like you need to bring the truck up. He'll bring it up, and then we would be the whole summer in Mississippi. And there, wow, there were no brown people, bro. Now there yeah. are. Now there are more uh, brown people there, but at that time it was just black and white. It was yeah. like. It's kind of like what the breakdown in, in American kind of race relationships are today. Like the discussion just goes around, uh, 
you know, black and white people and the relationships between black and white and mm -hmm. the kind of uh, growth of, of blacks or the kind of um, oppression of blacks. And then we're all the, the rest of us are like, hey, hey, wait a minute, us too? <laughs> Cabrón, like, I feel like the police has harassed me too, motherfucker. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, we yeah. could go back on this, you know, like, yeah. like y'all were the help. We are the help now. Cabrón yeah. is like, it's, it's, there's a lot of the same issues yeah, or a yeah. lot of overlap where now we'll say it's intersectional, right? Yeah. So I had to grow up in all these different places, the deep south, you know, here in L.A., going to Mexico. And, bro, I think it just helped me not be afraid of nothing. Mm. Like, if I walk into a room and it's all white people, I'd just be like, hey, white people, how are you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, let me get my trade of food también. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, go with Mexicanos, like, hey, yeah. Mexicanos, how are you? I go in with uh, the blacks, like, mm -hmm. with the blacks, hey, y'all, what's up? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what we call that. Code switching. Code switching, bro. I, I was like, I could code switch. And back to the rap thing. I think that's what also rap was about, was about code switching be between all of these mm. things that were integrated into our world with mm. social justice movement, with just slang on the street, with playing the dozens, with talking about like anywhere from brands or kind of transgressing mm. or kind of a using symbolic gestures that were supposed to be made for one culture and kind of appropriating those or or taking those and turning them into new meaning in another culture. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, like the Mercedes Benz logo or something, mm -hmm. you know, like I mean, people would, sna Volkswagen, people would yeah. snatch them and put them on a chain and then yeah. that became something else. Yeah. And I think that that code switching and that um, being able to like duck dive in and out of different rooms, but also just being like, yeah, like I I'm gonna be different. Like I'm gonna yeah. be different in these places. And it goes down to something as a, being a kid and being in a Circle K in Biloxi, Mississippi and playing video games with my primo and like black kids and white kids would come and just be staring at us, bro. Like one of them <laughs> staring at us and we'd look at them and be like, we're from LA, leave us alone. Yeah, yeah. Like you can't have our extra man, like get away <laughs> from us. Bro. And that was, that was like, that was kind of difficult being a young person, but that's also like where I even learned that like, where, I, where I'm talking about this kind of polarization of kind of race in the United States, like that's where I learned where like being brown was different because mm. bro, I remember going to Mobile, Alabama, we were like 10 or something and we went to a Chuck E. Cheese with my dad and my primos and my stepmom and them. And we went inside and bro, it was like a scene from the movie, the whole Chuck E. Cheese stopped like, Rrr! Wow. I think even Chucky like, stop. <laughs> like everything stopped. And we're like, and I was like, why is everybody like looking at us? Why, why, what's, what's us? They, they just never had seen brown people, bro, like us, like That's us, crazy, you know. Yeah. And they're like, how oh, these people speak English? They were just like tripping out on us. And um, and I think I kept that going through my schooling, and going through like the different spaces that I have to go through and navigate through, is that kind of fearlessness. And the other thing is like growing up in the harbor area. Like we grew up with all kinds of different people, but we grew up with like Samoans. Yeah. So like Samoans. Our area if, probably if, has the most mixed like group of people. Yeah. yeah. So if you Los if Angeles. you haven't grown up with Samoans, those are big, yeah. and the girls are big too. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. like if you haven't been punked by a Samoan girl in the third grade <laughs> for your like lunch money, <laughs> for, for like your ice cream money, I could totally. Yeah. If you're that. like if you're in line, they're like give me your quarters, and you're like fuck it, here's my quarters, right? Like. Yeah. Man, if you go into art, it's like no big Samoan girl. I promise you, no big Samoan girl is going to go punk you for your quarters in the art sphere, like art world. Oh, okay. They might try to tell you. And, you know, I've had hard times, like yeah. different little weird things that have happened to me, like, you know, for example. But, I've, I, you know, Este Rafa, the, the most prejudice that I felt like I've suffered from, yeah, there's been some, like, white people that have given me some little microaggressions and stuff. Mm. But the one that I really felt a real slap in the face from have been from people that were like more upper class Mexicanos, mm. you know, like Mexican nationals, you know, yeah, yeah. like I was in Texas one time at a big fundraiser for um, for this organization and I'm sitting there and they put you at these tables with people and it's kind of like a wedding. You're like, why do they mm. sit us with these deals? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. they, don't they know that we got in a fight last year? Why are we, <laughs> why, why are we with them? And like, so they said this with these people and the senora was there and she was all like blonde hair, do super no telenovela looking senora, right? So she's like, hey, Mario, like, how are you? I'm like, hey, how are you? She's like, oh, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm an artist. I've, I've done this and I've shown at this place and that place. And I gave her like my little resume, right? Mm -hmm. Bro. And the senora looked at me right in the eyes and she told me, tan morenito and has sido todo eso. Wow. Which translates <clears throat> over to you're so brown or dark complected and you've done all of that. Bro, my, my heart sank. And yeah. I like I like stood up and I just walked away. And I called my wife, my, my wife Carla Diaz, 
my wife and I was like, Legendary Car Carla Diaz. Yeah, I was like, Carla, the senora just like told me this. She's like, did you slap the bitch? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was like, no, I didn't slap her. If I was there, I would have slapped that bitch. Oh my and God. I'm like, oh, damn, you know, like, yeah. but I was like, I just like, what do I say? Yeah, yeah. And um, so, yeah, getting to be with them in these different um, spheres of different people and yeah. getting, being able to code switch and like, I guess, kind of like growing up in different conditions um is also been something that's either kind of made me but then uh, uh, like made me kind of be cautious or be able to read the room faster you yeah. know like what do you think you prefer like i or not prefer but maybe just tell us like the difference between like you know like your pencil drawings you know like it's just a sketchbook and it's you and it's your dark thoughts you yeah, know it's yeah. just like <laughs> all these things coming out onto a paper yeah amazing amazing and multi-layered images that have so many different characters and things of your history and your past all in this one drawing made with one pencil you know yeah what's the difference between that and then like you know getting like your show where you like get to put like installations on yeah. like amazing different things and have like a budget of, you know, yeah. $50,000 or whatever to put yeah, a show together. There's... Like what's the difference? You, maybe not what's the difference, but I don't know, just like how do you tell me a little bit about um yeah. how your experiences with these two different worlds is completely different. Yeah. yeah. Well, when when my father was a navy draftsman, right? So my father he lived in his Mrs. drawings too, by the way, yeah, which you've shared. Are, yeah, it's drawing, ridiculous. He's a beast, and um, but his drawings are like you know his technical drawings when he was drafting things for the, from the for the navy are totally different from his personal drawings, like because my father he's tattooed from like neck to foot, like yeah, yeah. his f hands, like he has all these old school like cholo tattoos, ones that he's did on himself, and even ones that he would go get at the pike when he was a teenager, mm -hmm. and all this history of kind of tattooing is kind of on his body, and they were all, like, they're like little stories. They're like old school tattoos, like, yeah, where it's yeah. just like patches, you know, like, this yeah. is a little patch, like, this is from this, <laughs> this is from this wife, this is, I covered that up, that wife up with this wife, you yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> like, like that kind of stuff, and um, multi-layered, multi-layered like that, and um, so as a kid here, he would send me every month a little box and in that little box were little drawing tools and he would mm. mark them with like tape he would put on them this lead is for the sketches wow. this lead is for you when you're drawing darker oh, and every month he would send me a new little box so when i was like by 12 13 years old i had like all these tools like a grown person would have yeah. like an electric pencil sharpener i had all that kind of stuff because he was he would just take it from the office and yeah, yeah, yeah. send it in the mail room to me you know what i mean that's awesome and um so drawing was always very personal Mm. A very personal space for me and by the time I got around to go to art school um, I felt I knew how to draw because like my dad he would teach me right like he would send me all this stuff so I was like by art school I was like oh, just let me get past this drawing part let so me just I, get A's and yeah so I, yeah. I, so I could get to like what I, the weird stuff that I see these other oh, okay. artists doing you know yeah, yeah. and um because in 2017, I graduated high school. Well, first of all, like going from Wilmas to like an art school, like what's up with that? How was your <laughs> arrival? How was like that culture clash? You know? Oh, man, I'll tell you. This day. So I like to draw, right? So I got to school. The worst grade I got at art school was in drawing. Because I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to listen to the teacher. That's I'll be like, he'd be like, do funny. this, do that. I'm like, ah, oh, fool. Like my dad taught me how to do this. I'm going to do yeah. whatever. The one. I'm going to yeah, throw yeah. his paint on it or whatever. But so probably. art school. <laughs> so I don't even saw nobody in a school when I was in in uh, in high school. The same thing. I had this teacher. Actually, it's a funny story because his name was Mr. Johnson. And on the first day in tenth grade, I signed up for art. You know, yeah. and he, he called my name, Mario Ibarra Jr. And I was like, here. And he looked up and he goes, Didn't I have you in my class twenty years ago? And I was like, No, that was my dad. He was my dad's oh, art no teacher way. too. Yeah. Oh, that's fucking bad. So he kind of like he was kind of cool with me because my dad had been his student. Yeah. So he would let us me and like three or four other kids kick it in like this back room with the real art supplies nice. like all the regular kids they got pencils mm -hmm. and they got you know uh, the cheap newsprint paper and all that but there was a certain group of us that he let like mm -hmm. we would be like mr johnson can we use the airbrush he would give us the key and we would kick oh. it out and like that 
So like I was doing art in high school, but nobody still told me I could go to college. But you already knew that art could get you extra privileges, right? There. Well, it got me a show in the library. <laughs> oh, <laughs> in the little ass. case in the library. That's and I wasn't no, I wasn't yeah. no jock or nothing like that. And I wasn't the king cholo and mm -hmm. you, know, you know nothing, nothing like that. Yeah. And I didn't have no nice car and nothing that all the other you know things like when you're in high school. That's yeah, what yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. Who knows today? There's probably, you know, king, whatever, queen, whatever, all of other <laughs> things. But back then, there was like, I wasn't any of those things. But, you know, I was kind of funny. I was class clown. Oh, yes, there. Were you really class clown in well, the yearbook? Or nah. you, you were a clown, though. You I was just a clown, clown fool. Yeah. Like, okay. just, just because I wasn't going to read no book. You yeah, know what yeah. I'm saying? I wasn't reading. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't reading like the Scarlet Letter for the, yeah, yeah. and then I find out like kids were reading that in middle school and I'm trying to read it as a senior I'm like come That's on fucking funny. and it's the um, so he, we weren't I didn't know I could go to college but then there was this girl her her um, her name was Elisa fool, and she had Doc Martin boots oh dog. <laughs> she had some burgundy Doc Martin boots well, I followed that girl everywhere bro That's everywhere funny. we went to uh, grad night together and all this and then she was like I'm gonna go to the community college mm -hmm. and I was like I'll go too, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. And so we went and we signed up for all the same classes, bro. Like the only thing we didn't sign up for funny. together was the art classes. Yeah. Oh, like week two, we break up. And then she's like, why aren't you going to health class no more? I'm like, because you're in the damn class. I don't want to see your face, but you're not in my art class. So, so I'm going to just, so the only classes I stayed in at the junior college was the art class. That's badass. And then they told me like, oh, you should, you're having, you're good. Like you should go to art school. And I was like, well, how do you do that? I don't have good grades. And they're like, oh, you just need a portfolio. Yeah. And I was like, a portfolio, what's that? And they just gave me like a list of everything I needed to <coughs> talk, go through. And I'm, I, so I said, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it and try it. And I, I went, and then I, w I got accepted to go to two programs. Like one was like a summer program at Otis and another mm. one was like a, in the evening program at Art Center. Mm. The evening one at Art Center was like a graphic design one, but it was all older people and Art Center was too clean. Like mm. I felt like, dang, you can't even make a mess here. Like, it's, it's, like yeah. but Otis, bro, <laughs> and Otis, it was comfortable because it was in MacArthur Park at mm. that time. Mm. And like, all these, all you these. went to that campus. Yeah, bro. So wow. all these Mara Salvatruchas are trying to sell micas in the yeah, park yeah. and machine gun fire, like, brrrr, in, like, the park. And we would be in the library uh, and we'd hear, like, brrr, 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 and everybody, all the wow. students are, like, hitting the deck under the table. Wow. So I was like, I could, so art school in Otis at, at MacArthur Park, coming from Wilma, so I was like, yeah. all right, like, I could it do this. Like yeah, I know what's up. Like, <laughs> the parking man sold weed, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. at the parking structure, he sold the wow. weed. And I, so I was like, well, we could do this. Like, I could, I could navigate this space. Yeah, yeah. And all the, all the p girls that work in the cafeteria, they were like all these punk rock girls with piercings, but all their piercings weren't like metal. Like now you get metal. Like all their piercings were with zip ties, bro. Like <laughs> they like stuck a zip tie in the hole and, and I was like, wow, this place is crazy. It smelled wow. like chocolate chip cookies and weed. Yeah, and that's way that. different than the art center <laughs> campus. Yeah, yeah the, the art hills. center like wasn't for me. So that's I was a like, beautiful place, but it's and then they had the mariachis right there, La Fonda. Yeah. So I felt like, oh, this is yeah. like I know this. Like I know I understand this world. Yeah. The ladies selling bacon wrap hot dogs. Yeah, and, yeah. So I was like, oh, and then. But the thing that got me through there, through Otis, is that we consolidated our efforts. There was another artist, uh, like a, two years ahead of me. His name is Ruben Ochoa. He, mm. he does really great as an artist yeah. today. But him and the homies that were like a couple years ahead of me, they started a group called Lasso, okay. Latino Artist Student Organization. Oh, wow. And it was when uh, <coughs> Camilo Alvarez, Carmelo Alvarez, had the little cafe, Luna Soul Cafe. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. So he had the little, he had, he had the little cafe. Let's go at night for the poetry thing. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So it was cool because being at Otis, being in the art school, but still being in like, you know, the MacArthur Park area, Westlake, and then to have... Um, little community spot. The little community spot with yeah. poetry and all that. And then as our little group, we would have tried to have little art shows there and yeah. stuff. And um, so um, that made it, that made it good because I had... I had homies at school mm. and you know they had all come from different barrios from all southern california all the way from san diego to up here and all through it so like we just became tight like okay this is our group this is who we go to we're having some problem with whatever you teach. got jumped in yeah we, got, we had to get jumped <laughs> in bro essentially because um bro there's like all the rest of the kids like a lot of those kids they come from wealth and they come from privilege yeah. and they could afford to go to school there i 
bro, I still owe Otis all the money that I was. I, I'm never paying them, bro. I shoplifted my education, homie. I felt like some motherfucker shoplifted a you piece of carne asada, bro. You ran on the bill. I, I, fucking, <laughs> I ran on that shit, bro. I fucking, uh, how do you what call it? A, a dash dinner? Yeah, hey, hey, the fucking dined and dash with my whole know. college education, dog. What? I still got that. Look at it's all right That's... here, my body. You got food four years of an <laughs> education, homie. The collection well, on your resume, too, bro. Bro, dine like, and dash, full, my fucking... like fools dine and dash on a piece of fucking oh. EBT. T steak, wow. homie. I dined to dash on my whole goddamn education. Right. Wow, dude. I ain't gotta pay him, bro. Like, I'm waiting for that fucking the Biden, Biden to hook us up, pero I don't know. But yeah. I'm like, bro, I, I'm never paying this back. Fuck how these fools? How exactly? Yeah, how? Yeah, yeah. And um, I was like, you know, fuck them. And yesterday, La Sally May, she could get in line <laughs> with everybody else, dog. <laughs> <laughs> so I always, I always tell the Sally like, May is still after my tia. Yeah, bro, <laughs> my she, tia's gonna get her money first, yeah, tia, and then Sally yeah, May. I try to pay my tia yeah, back yeah. though. My tia was, like, my tia was I'll like, pay my she, tia in installments. I try, I was yeah. paying my tia installments, That's and then one time funny, I sent her a dude. payment, and she was like, "No, no, don't worry about it. Your nana like took care of it. Now I gotta hold ah. my nana. <laughs> <laughs> your, your nana like, your wow. nana didn't tell you she paid me off for you. Like, nah. That's fucking funny. But dude. we were just funny because. We, Jennifer, my uh, studio manager, and I were talking about how, like, to get ahead in life, a lot of people from privilege get their loans from their family, right? Yeah. Yesterday, I was telling her about um, Barry Gordy, who started Motown. Yeah. Like, his family uh, owned a mercantile store, so they were, like, had their business. Mm -hmm. And uh, he went to school, and he came back, or he went to the service and came back, and he was like, I want to start a music um, studio. <laughs> And he got he borrowed four thousand dollars from his parents hmm. to start Motown. And what he did with it, he, well, this is like I don't know, nineteen fifty whatever. Mm -hmm. He bought a home, but that home was the first the Motown studio. building. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and, he, and eventually, you know, he bought eight houses on the block. Damn. And that was Motown Records. Yeah. So I'm like, damn, how much money do I got to borrow right now? Yeah. But I'm like, <laughs> but I'm like way behind on everybody I owe. Bro, Disney started Disneyland when he was 52. So oh, 52. Yeah. So it was never too late. Yeah, we got a lot. I got a lot of experience. I gotta cash it in, bro. Yeah. Let Let's talk a little bit about um, <laughs> language and like how that came about. Well, it came out of an urgency, bro. Like, okay. it came out of fucking urgency because, yeah. okay, the gen we're hip hop generation. Well, first right? tell them what language okay, is. Okay, so language is a studio that my wife, Carla Diaz, and I and some other friends founded in 2002. So next year will be 20 years. And it's a, when I got wow. out of grad school, we needed a place to work because we weren't going to have access to all the stuff that was in the school that we had been going to, <laughs> right? Like, no more Dine and Dash. No more yeah. Dine and Dash. <laughs> And um, they already yeah, have my. At home they, now. Hey, they already had my picture on the wall, by the, <laughs> on the exit that said "Rata de dos patas." Bro. <laughs> Rata de dos patas, Ooh, like this fool. <laughs> yeah, this fool, like a black and white picture of me putting my whole <laughs> education in my pants. That's yes, hilarious. Yes, they, um, so we're like, man, we need a space to work. So, um, I at first when I first got of school, I had a little tiny studio in the women's building that's mm. right there on North Spring Street, right by where th this is a cornfield, right by Chinatown yeah, over yeah. there. Yeah, it was a little tiny, little tiny room. And uh, one of my big homies, his family owns a Mexican restaurant over there in Wilmington, and they have to go to the produce market, you know, right there mm -hmm. off of San Pedro Street, the big produce market. Mm -hmm. So one day I went with him up there, and I was like, hey, I was like, hey, you want to see my studio? And he's a big guy, too. We went into my studio, bro. He was like, how do you even walk in here? Like, we had to, like, do, like, tiny, a little dance yeah. to get past him. And he was like, I'm not. So I saw that one of his buildings, because his family owns different properties, they had a storefront for rent. And I was like, hey, bro, I want to rent this spot. And he was like, oh, I, he didn't see me as a real, <laughs> real <Yeah>. client, <laughs> but he wanted to rent it to like a, a I don't know, office or something. Yeah, of course. And, um, but like, it was fucked up, bro. It was like an ugly place inside. Yeah. It was all painted brown. And it's it the was the best kind of place. It, yeah. yeah. And, and, um, none of the people, none of like his real clients wanted it. So I kept calling him every day. You got to be persistent or shit, right? Like, yeah. I call him this fool every day. And he was like, on a Friday, I called him all week. And then finally on Friday, he's like, come get the key. I'm sick of your ass. <laughs> <laughs> come get the key from me. And he was like, I, he was, I don't want to hear shit. You're going to pay me this much money a month. And if something breaks or it's the toilet, you. it's on you. And yeah. I was like, well, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Like, that's perfect for me anyway. And so anyway, that's how we rented the place. And as soon as we got it, there, that's where we get to the urgency part. Because like our generation growing up in the, you know, 
in in the 70s 60s 70s or you know however far back there's always kind of been gang activities in the in barrios but in the 80s and 90s is when all the crackdown on gangs kind of came down with the sentencing and uh, weapons got more <clears throat> were more in the street and all the cocaine trade and all of that really kind of amplified like turf wars and stuff because people were trying to hold down their blocks to sell the dope that they needed to mm. sell and all that and you know the, with that came heavier prison sentences and a lot of death you know there was a lot of death i don't know in those Ladies years were horrible yeah. yeah i remember <clears throat> i remember there was like you know they were just really bad and here in los angeles week uh, after week yeah like or really yeah. bad and um so when i was in school See, like, all my, I grew up with, like, seven boys on my block. Uh, four of them served long-term federal and state prison sentences. The other the other, other three, went in, two besides me, went into, like, working in the docks and stuff. And then I was like, oh, man, like, like I want to be free. Like, I, I wanted to, mm -hmm. if my homies went to the California State Prison, I was going to go to the University of California. Like, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. It's like when you're driving on the five and that's all you really see exits for, are like, state prisons and, yeah. and <laughs> Colleges. <laughs> in colleges i was like i'm gonna get up on the next one bro yeah, like yeah. I'll, peace i'll see you in 32 years 10 years 14 years like that Crazy. and um so for the generation below me there was a real urgency for them to have alternative models like seeing somebody mm. like you know alternative models of like how to be a person and how to have a lifestyle and how to live and you know, before I went to college too, you know, there was a big, a big movement of expression in Los Angeles that was also tied to hip hop, which was the graffiti culture. Yeah, right. So like the graffiti culture was really prolific in the you know early '90s, late '80s, early '90s. A lot of uh, there was places like the Belmont Yard, which was a kind of like de facto art school for a lot of different people, mm -hmm. and like the alleys and the Venice Beach and all these different places around town that were really like the art schools for those generations of artists where and you can go and watch other people do and yeah, interact share with them, tips. share things. And, you know, and that's, that's a school. That's yeah. what a school is. Yeah. And, um, so a lot of the young people, when I came home from graduate school, so I went to school at UC Irvine after Otis, then I, cause I went there because they had the only Mexican American, uh, or Chicano, person from LA teaching at a graduate level and that was a man named Daniel J. Martinez mm. and he's from Lennox. Mm. So like I was like, oh this dude's from Lennox. He has like a different perspective than just a Eastlos perspective, mm. right? So mm. I'm like, what is this guy about? And he's the only one teaching at a graduate level and the Trip. whole and the whole yeah. whole everywhere. So I let me go work with this dude. So I I learned from him. I taught he was my teacher. And then um and then I came back home and we ran his language and but all these kids needed a, pl a, s a place to go uh, they needed i wasn't planning on being their <laughs> place to go i was yeah. i was hoping that i was a place for me to go yeah, yeah. and like as soon as we got there uh they started knocking on the door mario what are you doing in there what are you doing in there i'm like oh i'm trying to make art oh we want to make art yeah. too uh, uh boys will come in you know and they i want to draw well here's paper go over there yeah, oh, you I just have paint. that natural like do this if yeah like you know, you know if it's available why yeah not, yeah because you know? i say that i went from painter to pointer rafa <laughs> <laughs> and then people are like what's a painter to pointer i was like ah because i used to paint now i just point they're like what do you mean you point i'm like yeah motherfucker go do that over there yeah, yeah no no you go fucking do that over there so go from painter to pointer like when you're like yeah. right there meditating to where like you're having to run a crew of people doing yeah. shit is a, is a different different perspective you're still getting shit done it's just in yeah. a different way and um so trip. that's all those people started coming in the studio and that's kind of how slang which started and uh that became my work like i because yeah. you know people are coming in and you're facilitating i didn't really have that chance to paint or draw but i'm really lucky and i have uh, great people that want to come visit me like you've been to the studio like yeah. people come visit and they would be looking at the wall of all this stuff and they'd be like, oh, Mario's like, is this your painting? And I'd be like, oh no, that's this kid, Eric. He wants to draw every Ozzy Osbourne album cover. <laughs> wow. oh, oh, is this, was this yours? No, that's his graffiti artist, Pearl. She she has a crew called Females Destroying Society. Nice. And like, that's her stuff. She would take photos when, cause she was a tomboy, bro. Like, mm. like a certain segment of of the women graffiti artists that they're fucking gangster as fuck and they'll climb everything <laughs> and just hang off of everything. And she was one of those because she was in TKO for a minute and she lived in the apartments they build on the Belmont tunnel. Oh, really? Yeah, she, <laughs> lived in those, she lived in those apartments. Wow. So she was like, Through she was everywhere, everywhere yeah. doing stuff. And they'd be like, oh, is this yours? I'd be like, oh, no, that's. 
pearl when she climbs up on something she takes photos mm. like so those are her mm. photos of like spots that only graffiti artists get to right yeah that's and crazy their interaction <laughs> with people is a lot different than a normal person's interaction with yeah. people because they're like kind of like skateboarders they find spots yeah graffiti artists are looking for spots yeah, and yeah. like skaters too they want to yeah, yeah. find the spots like you too i imagine you look for spots when well, you take well your show is called landscapes cabron like yeah, what are you yeah, talking yeah. about it's about <laughs> spots <laughs> it's that's a, true i guess it's about <clears throat> spots so that's how the that's how the studio kind of started and that's language studio and now it's 20 years of doing it in different locations and different configurations yeah. And, and uh, going from painter to pointer, like, how does that, like, from from the artist, like, from the gut, from what comes out of you, like, how does that feel different? You know, like, um, if you're putting on a show now, you have a team, right? Yeah. Puts all your stuff together. And how does that feel different? Or how does that, what kind of satisfaction do you get as an artist from that, from being the pointer? Yeah, from being the pointer, it, it, you, you do get a kind of satisfaction as, like, parts get done. Because yeah. it's, it's kind of like, I, I would imagine, I, I'm not a film director, but... Yeah, it's being a, the helm of a, of a movie. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of like, so I, I'm like, I, I kind of set the tone. Like, I usually try to get things kind of started or the feel for things started. Mm -hmm. Like the research, and I'll even do sketches. Not like literal sketches, but I'll do like video sketches or mm -hmm. sound sketches or record things. But I think as our, our job as an artist, besides making the visual part is to be like keen observers not only with our eyes but also with our ears mm -hmm. like uh, i think like a big big uh point of being an artist is also being a big eavesdropper mm -hmm. like you know what i mean mm -hmm. like you go to a cafe or you go sit somewhere like my wife always gets mad at me because i'm like listening to the other table mm -hmm. she's like why aren't you paying attention to me i'm like oh hold on they're having a good conversation <laughs> like two tables over <laughs> like i'm so like trying to like l like always be observant and have that on and like kind of pulling things from the world. So mm. when I get to the table with like a, a editor or with uh, somebody that's going to be developing a soundtrack for me, mm. like I could give them kind of like hints or pointers mm -hmm. to like where I want them to kind of go. Like I want to work with those people because they have certain skills yeah, of course. that that I like, like, oh, that I liked how they edit things or, oh, I like how they put together music or I like how they view things or I feel like I could trust them. There's like a reciprocal relationship that isn't just one way because when I throw something out, they come back, they come mm -hmm. back to me like, like, oh yeah, Mario, like this is what we did. And I'm like, oh yeah, you got what I was saying. Like, mm -hmm. and even either <clears throat> you took it to the next level of what even I was thinking about. Like, yeah, yeah. I didn't know you're gonna take out that drone. I didn't know you're gonna take out that drone. <laughs> and I didn't know you're gonna be like chopping up that beat like yeah, that. Yeah. I didn't know. So, so, but then there's a moment, the scary part of it, bro, is letting it grow, go. Cause like yeah, you yeah. could do that part. Like you, you could do all the research part and all this thing. And you could be there when we're shooting segments, but you can't always be there on the edits and you can't always be there on yeah. that. But you're the scariest part, bro, is letting that part go. And that is being on the offensive. Like if you think of like in sports, mm. like you can't be just defensive with the ball. You got to mm. be offensive. You got to try to make those baskets. You got to try to get mm. to those first downs. <laughs> and part of that is like letting go of the ball. You got the quarterback or you, you got to release the yeah. fucking ball. And but that part's scary because it's up in the air. Yeah. So you could get fucked up or you, you could go or well. Or you pass the ball and you hope that your team. Yeah, you yeah. pass it. So, you, But that has to be on the offensive. So that moment when you're letting it go and putting it into the other people's hands for them to to take it down the line or whatever, yeah. that that could be nerve wracking. I think that's one of the things that scares me about filmmaking, too, because I keep saying I want to make film and stuff. Yeah, but, but see, that's where the drawing, that was where the drawing step in, because then the drawings can be like mm. a subsidiary. This is what I want. So or no, or, or just a distraction. <laughs> <laughs> a distraction like okay when well, i make those drawings and something so you let it go and then you're like i'm over here drawing now. i'm over here drawing i'm in this space this I, kind I of like focus space and that, that, there's nothing that's I could do. fucking that because there's fucking nothing i can yeah. do about it I, I i try to build a crew yeah that's you know, strong that that's that strong you trust. yeah that is like, a good team yeah like a build Surround my little yourself team with smart people yeah like you know like like uh jennifer Venegas Rocha has been like my wife, Carla and I, studio manager for the past while, but we've been working with her for a few years on different projects. Mm -hmm. But she's my bad cop. So goes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I could be the good cop. You know what I mean? Like, hey, what's up, dude? Like, are you going to, yeah, yeah, we need to this. Oh, yeah. we need to, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm to we're going we're gonna to WeTransfer yeah, you yeah. this. We're going to send yeah. you these files. Yeah, you're going to send me these files. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we're going to go look at the location. We're going to do some, you know, just do some B-roll stuff, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. 
or okay, I need this fabricated. Okay, we're gonna build it. Okay, let's get some quotes, and then the quotes come back, and you want to like, ah, that's crazy yeah. expensive. But you're like, oh, we got some options. Give me some options on the table. Um, that's funny. But um, she could be the bad cop. Like, okay, we need dates. We need invoices from you. Like, we're not paying you until you give us an invoice. Yeah. Like, but like Mario said, he could pay us. Like, no, you haven't got an invoice from you. <laughs> Nobody's paying you nothing until we get an invoice yeah, yeah. and we were seeing part. Yeah. Like you said that you would be able to get us this. Mario has one job and Jennifer has another job. Yeah, and Jennifer I, has to protect. Yeah, you have to protect part, the yeah. project. Like that, you need yeah. those bad cops because most yeah. people that you start working with, well, for me at least, because I'm not working with a huge crew, but yeah. they start. You know, they're close. Yeah. They're close to me, so you know, I, I, and then I, yeah, you want to. I want to be seen as. But if you, if I have to step in, I will. But those, those notions of like those bigger projects, because then you're also dealing with institutions or whoever is kind of yeah, commissioning like for example, these projects. You're showing Arizona, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, how, how, tell me about that. How did that come to be too? And and did you draw all that? No, oh, it's not drawn. It's a billboard print. Okay. Oh yeah. shit. <laughs> See, I thought it was a giant drawing. No. So what happened? So that project. So I just. So Rafa's talking about this project I did in. Uh, I'm. It's up currently up right now at Arizona State University Museum, which is in Tempe, Arizona, near Phoenix. And that project, uh, it's a part of the last installment of a trilogy. This is mm. where I think of like a filmmaker mm. a lot. I don't mm. know if it's because we're here in LA or whatever. Well, you gotta do it in threes. Threes, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, um, so I've been doing these projects about my friends. I was telling you that I had these friends that are in prison, family members that are in prison. When they come out of prison, I do these kind of like what I call portraits of them via like their interest or their stories mm. uh like i had a friend that went to federal prison for narcotics trafficking but he collected scarface memorabilia mm. he went to prison and then in 2008 i for the whitney biennial i created this installation that was called the scarface museum which was mm. part of all of his collection and things that i had collected and performances i did like on south beach in front of the the hotel uh, where they filmed the chainsaw scene, yeah, yeah. like I would, do, I would read the chainsaw <laughs> scene from the screenplay and on the beach, and then I'd give people That's walking tours to where funny. that building was. Yeah, at. Yeah, yeah. I'd be like, Brrr! <laughs> <laughs> Brrr! and uh, and then my other friend went to prison, but before he went to prison, he was doing his money laundering through a comic book shop called Heroes and Villains. Wow. So when he came out of prison, I made a comic book about his story. Wow. And um, and now my friend, I had a friend, the first friend that I, w my best friend when I was a kid, when I was 14 and he was 16, he shot and killed another teenager and he wow. was sentenced to a 17 year to life prison sentence. And um, for the past 10 years or so, I've been trying to uh, make a project for him because in the pizza parlor that we grew up going to is called Red West Pizza. It's on Pacific Coast Highway. There's above the windows. I think it was an old Shakey's because it kind of yeah. has that look with the brick and all that. You know that the one that's top. right there on Boyle Heights, the yeah. Shakey's? It kind of looks like that and has like old tools and stuff on the mm -hmm. I think it was a Shakey's and they sold it. But they have like the windows where you can see the senores like making the pizza. Mm -hmm. You can like look in there and there's three big windows and above it is the, the menu. But in between those, there's a long panoramic photograph of the 1984 little league teams from the will hall parks you know like on the benches mm. and there's the pirates and the dodgers and everybody right and he's i think he was on the pirates so he's like 10 or 11 and they're in that photograph so for the past 32 years when i go eat at that pizza parlor even with my wife carla i'm like oh you got to sit on that side of the table because i'm having lunch with richard mm. like i'm having lunch with him in that <laughs> photograph and um so i've always thought of his story in relationship to that place and their pizza pans the sizes you could buy are personal, small, medium, large, family. And I always thought that that was poetic in relationship to hmm. the effects that his being in prison and incarceration has had. Yes, it's had a personal level. It's been at a small level. It's been at a medium and it's been at a large and it's been at a family, like communally, Everybody, all yeah. these different levels. People have been affected by his incarceration. And um, I, man, I, I was pitching that project because I wanted to make an installation of the whole pizza parlor, like mm. go big, right? Like, yeah. and I would have like people from France and different places coming for biennials and stuff, and I would take them there. And all the little homies were like, "Who are those weird people you had here <laughs> in the pizza parlor?" And I'd be like, "Oh, that's like a curator from France." And this is they're like, "Why were they looking at everybody like that?" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "They're looking at us like we're like, like safari. Yeah, shit. like we're yeah. monkeys in the yeah. zoo, bro. Like who?" Are people why are they here That's right funny. yes they um 
so I've been wanting to make this piece for a long time and it just never clicked and never clicked with anybody I would pitch it to. Mm. And I'm, I'm sure you understand this too. Like you have these ideas, but you need to find backers and you need to find support and you're like pitching them, pitching them, pitching them, pitching them. And mm. you get, you start getting better at it as you practice, mm. but it's really important for you not to take it personal if it doesn't click mm. with that certain people you're trying to pitch it with, because there's a next group of people you're going to pitch it to and it's going to get better when you mm. do it or it's not just not the right timing or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, so man, I was pitching it and pitching it. And uh, the other funny part of that, that place is they have a salad bar. <laughs> but the salad bar is one time only. You can't go back and refill. What? No <laughs> refills, bro. It has a big sign on it that says no refills. No. <laughs> so all the senoras, like all the moms, mm. they go and they go get it. They buy one salad bar. And they fill it up like <clears throat> to be like two feet tall, That's bro. They crazy. make all kinds of like, they make like a, a layer of piña slices yeah. at the bottom and they fill it so up I with pasta. It, yeah. and they go like all, <laughs> all the way up, all the way up. And um, wow. so I wanted that to be part of the installation too. So I, finally, a couple summers ago, a curator- You did do that one somewhere, yeah. Yeah, I, I did it in the desert. <clears throat> in the desert X. But I found out that you sometimes you can't pitch your whole project to certain people. Mm. Like sometimes you need to part it up. Mm. So they, they invited me to do this project in the desert that was had like a pizza parlor and another kind of things there, like the community that I was like, oh, so maybe I could do this salad stacking part competition there out of there in the desert. That's, That's like fun. one part to get it started, like to um, break the ice on the project. Yeah, yeah. And then this two summers ago, the <clears throat> curators from Arizona came out and they're like, what do you want to do, Mario? And I was like, well, I just finished doing the salad stacking contest out there in the desert. But I, but the real project, like I was feeling like that was a promo, yeah, yeah, yeah. like that was like a promo, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a, a trailer, promo. yeah, yeah, pro trailer, Andale trailer. Yeah. The real project is to create an installation that's life size, the same size as like where you walk in or where you order the pizzas inside of the pizza parlor, and um, and I want to recreate that so when people come in, they could get a sense of all the story I'm telling you about my friend Richard, and um, and then halfway through doing it well i got covid and i was in the hospital and I was like, you mm. came to visit me in the window <laughs> uh, you and este manuel and um so i was fucked up in the hospital and then but i had started all that legwork i was telling you about i mm. started doing the like little scenes and little things so but then just timing would have it that halfway through the project my friend would be released from prison after 32 wow. years he was paroled so we were able to interview him so that so the windows that you would normally see the senoras all making in the pizza. Timing. That's yeah, it's perfect. It's all in the he timing. He was already out. And yeah, you wouldn't it know. Just added so much so you, more. So those it. things you might get frustrated because you're yeah. not getting it, getting able to do them. Yeah, yeah. It just might be the timing ain't right. Yeah. Even though you have all your story you together. You gotta read your horoscope, bro. <laughs> story, <laughs> something. Because <laughs> pinche, that's um, pinche things are in reggaeton or reg <laughs> retrograde. <laughs> Mercury's in reggaeton. <laughs> but but I heard, I heard an <laughs> artist I heard an artist <laughs> say that sometimes your projects are like being in the, the way he said it was sometimes you think your projects like are are gonna happen fast because mm. sometimes it's like going to the airport you have a ticket mm. say like oh I got a ticket to go to Germany but there's storms the 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 engines yeah. fucked up on the plane you gotta wait so you have your ticket yeah. you, you're gonna sometimes get sometimes you don't have enough money to buy the ticket yet. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you're researching the prices <laughs> you're like, right yeah, but you're saying yeah. like you could have your ticket but you'll be stalled yeah like things will stall out and but you have your ticket you'll get there eventually yeah. you don't you might know exactly I mean, the important thing is to always yeah. keep working right just yeah. keep growing keep creating keep keep producing things and how do you keep doing that? Like continue to like always have like something new in the books or continue to like make different art too. Cause you also go like different, you go from painting. To uh, Cause I'm ADD meal. <laughs> <laughs> That's just some ADD shit. I take medication, yeah, but sometimes yeah, it don't work yeah, though. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, I, I will, I'm hoping, I think cause our generation too, since we're breaking a lot of ground. Cause like the older school, let, let me just say real quick, like, I think that, like, with your drawings alone, like, you could kill it. Yeah, I know, but I made it deep, but you, you jump into, like, all these other things, but it's also, I mean, because for me, it's like, <laughs> I like to continually challenge myself. Yeah, I think that's And it's part kind of, of that, too, right? Yeah, like, you want to you want to beat, some, you want to win at something else, or you want to, you know, have fun with, or at least try it. Yeah, You yeah. know, it's like. Yeah, I think, I think my, like, my drawings, like, like I said, they're very meditative, yeah. and I got a C in drawing. 
And, <laughs> <laughs> este, at that, I made, I made, a, I made an allegiance. I made an allegiance. I was like, ah, pinche art ain't never getting my drawings. Like, yeah. you know, oh, art, uh, shit. I made it, but now I'm like, I'm changing. Well, that's that. cool. I like. But that, I was bro. like, man, art, yeah. art gets everything else, bro. It gets yeah. my life, it gets my stories. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna keep my drawings personal. And then oh, maybe like badass. 10 years ago, my dad came to the pad and he was looking at my sketchbook and he was like, oh, he finally told me, he goes, oh, you could draw now. Oh, <laughs> and shit. I was like, I'm 30, whatever, I'm 38 years old back then. Oh, I was like, shit. it was like 2010. Yeah. So I was like, I was like, man, I can always draw. But um, I think the drawing is a meditative space for me personally. Mm. It, it like, and, and I don't bring in the critic. Mm. So I know other people that draw, like that's their only thing that I they do. I, do, I call it line therapy. Like I just draw in a sketchbook all the time, just because it's it is so therapeutic. Yeah, it I actually good. actually yeah. feel like when I finish a session, I feel like my brain actually like went it, yeah. like like shifted. So my drawings for me, I draw and I draw and I and I and, and I do only use one pencil. Like I've like. Yeah. That's a challenge, right? Like, can I fuck this up with one pencil? Like, because I know, like, if I want to get like a six B, yeah. I could just r go through this real yeah, fast. There's other artists that post like this drawing was five hundred pencils and shit. No, I'm like one pencil, and I get that shit down to the nub, dog. Yeah, like, yeah. I'll I fucking get that whole dollar fifty worth, homie. <laughs> <tell> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, yeah. I go all the way down to the nub, and I'm like, draw, and I'm like, and the funny part is sometimes the backgrounds on my drawings take me longer to do than if I drew a figure, like, because because mm. I go over them and over yeah. and, and over them. But um, yeah, I, and I and I I don't use a critic in my drawing like at all. I don't I don't think I'm solving any social issues mm, or anything. I just yeah. like going deep into yeah, my it's, my it's imagination and a, my cerebral stream of consciousness. Stream of consciousness. Yeah, all the things that are like you put all these little tiny things in your yeah. Because my dad That's told exactly me exactly what you're thinking of at that moment. Yeah, whatever I'm thinking of, whatever I'm pulling in, and my because my dad told me when he told me that I could draw, he said, "Yeah, you could draw now, but never show these to a lawyer or a psychiatrist." <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm doing these other type of projects, they're like, must be on their homework, dog. Because I like work with mm, the curator. It's like a report. They're like, I'm working with the curator. Yeah. The show, that show that I'm in in Arizona is about the prison industrial complex. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm working with an institution. I'm working with this or that. And yeah. the, the projects that the, that the, the create an outline. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're pro the projects that they're doing are like more for like uh, different types of issues. And they're more the, the, the outside kind of a, a, they're more from a cerebral space, more mm. from like a kind of logical space. Mm. But like when I go to the drawings, I I, I, I leave all that shit at the door. Like mm. I need to do, like if I want to draw chichis, if I want to yeah, draw yeah. feet, if I want to draw peepees, like <laughs> <laughs> whatever comes out, like I'm not edit yeah, yeah. editing it. I'm like, okay, like this girl's doing yoga and this guy's doing something. Yeah. dancing and then this this cartoon character is doing this and yeah selena's dope someone draw selena yeah. in there so yeah so i don't i i, I man i wonder what a, what a novel would be like if you wrote a book with your stream of consciousness like <laughs> well th that's Where funny you bring you that up because i just got my first commission to write an what? introduction to another artist oh, okay. um not a novel but an intro introduction to another artist uh work for their catalog and, um, is this for a specific show or for all it, of? Yeah, like it's for their it's for their work. <laughs> like they're he, they were my student in 2017. Mm. I, I, I taught at Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, and mm. this this young dude he was one of the painters, but he was like an art school dropout, mm. more like a skateboarder, graffiti kind of. Mm. And I, 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 got I along, yeah. yeah, we got along. Yeah, yeah. But I would always tell him like, because he would be making these paintings, and they were like the official painting, like the, mm. on a canvas and stuff. But then he would be making all these really cool drawings on the side. On the side. <laughs> and I would I'd be like, bro, like, why ain't this shit in mm. your painting? Like, why is it on the paint on the drywall? That's fucking funny. That ain't that. That's interesting. That though. is. We're going to paint this. Over. Because this is what the school or or what art is telling him to do. Yeah, because art is telling yeah. him he has to be on a canvas. And yeah. maybe that's what the difference is, how I shift back and forth from like. When I'm making a project or an installation, I shift back into like what art mm. has kind of trained me to do, mm. what I have the training do, to do and the facility to do. And then the drawings are like those things on the, kind of like those things on the wall for Your him. Your doodles in a way. Oh, my doodles in a way. And um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Well, I'm a Libra. We were both Libras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people always tell me, oh, man, you're Libra. That means you're balanced. And like, nah, fucker, that means I'm... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not always. It's, <laughs> it's not, not always. It's the, the no, the life struggle for yeah, a Libra yeah. is trying to keep that shit balanced. Yeah, like yeah, other yeah. than that, like I'm, I'm like going to extremes. 
but man, I, I don't know, Rafa. Like, I, I, I feel like uh, what I was, what I was gonna get back to saying is, I feel like for me coming out when I came out of school and stuff, there were so few. Uh, well, now it's Latinx. Like now it's Latinx. Like Chicano, Chicano with the X, Chicano X. <laughs> like they were like, it was like a name shift time. Like Chicano. O. I was a tweener. I was a tweener, dog. Like a betweener, yeah. right? Because it wasn't like hardcore Chicano ness. <laughs> tweener. That were like Chicano art, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, you can make that face. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Right, like that face, and then our like we're like okay, like we're we're not in that time frame. Like yeah. we have, we grew up in those belief systems. We grew up in those understandings. We're down with all that stuff. We want to be in continuum of that stuff, but we don't have a we don't have an exact generational yeah. name. That's why I'm always envious of the Japanese American homies because mm -hmm. they have like the different Nisei names. Yeah, the, they have Nisei, Nisei. Onsei. They have the yeah. different names for their for different the generation. Yeah, I'm like damn, like I want well, that. Well, you do too. You're Gen X. No, pero that's but not that's within that. But that's not a Chicano that. thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm Gen X you're, in terms of like... Gen. You're Chican at with the at symbol. Yeah, the at symbol. <laughs> but see, that was in a show that there was called Post Chicano mm -hmm. in that LACMA. And then there, a lot of the old school cats where they were all mad at that. Like, oh, we're not yeah. over, motherfucker. And I'm like, I get, but there was no name exactly. There was no like generation. There's always going to be... No, because even the hoods, there. they have different generational names, right? They'd be like the Pee Wees, the Tiny Locals. Oh. Like there's a... Like, like, different the, cliques. There's a hood, but then every generation has yeah, their yeah. cliques. Yeah. And I'm like, damn. Why like, don't you just sorry? name it right now? <laughs> well, I don't, but that's not like... <laughs> the Latinx kids are doing it. <laughs> That's the, yeah, that's yeah. right now. Like I can't name them right now. They're doing it, so they they got, and it's also kind of a little bit better because I was always feel guilty when I would have like my students with me and they would be like from Honduras, El Salvador, mm, like wherever. And, you would say and then I'd go Chicano. to we'd go somewhere and then the person, my top guest or whatever, would be like Chicano, we're all Chicano, and the kids. I'd be looking at my kids like, hey, stop. So, so, I was like, do you guys identify with Chicano? Most of them do. Yeah. Did because they grew up in Chicano barrios, like yeah, because yeah. that's that's where they grew up at. So, but. But it didn't always like fit completely. Yeah, that makes and, sense. And the Latinx is a little bit more inclusive. Yeah. Besides the gender thing, it's also just inclusive of like the pan Latino experience that we're having. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so, yeah. So, I don't know. That's that kind of complicated in a lot of different routes that we're talking about and stuff. But I, I'm really excited, like, for right now because there's. I hope it's not just because it's Latino History Month, bro. Because <laughs> 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 we're getting. I'll take it, bro. Yeah, bro, bro I'll take it. We gotta stretch our shit out all year, <laughs> doggy. Like I was like, because I was like, whenever. Oh, yeah. I was like, there's getting a lot of a lot of artists getting attention. I'm very proud yeah. of all everybody. Whenever it happens, just yeah, take it. Yeah, I'm very it. proud of everybody, and I I feel like I'm like a I feel like I I I want to be a big cheerleader for yeah. everybody because, bro. Uh, and I want us to be able to build in these tools. So, like, if any other artist, real is, quick, yeah. I, I didn't realize how much, how far we had gotten oh, in time. Shit, it's over. But party's over, G. The no, just flicking the lights <clears throat> on right now. It's not over yet. <laughs> I just want to uh, get to like, what do you think? Like, because we talked about your past a lot. We talked about all this stuff. What do you think? Um, like, the future holds for you and for Slanguage. Well, well, for me, oh, I want to be. Kind, what kind of vision do you have? Well, for well, for Slanguage and for me. Well, language has always been a de facto art school. Like all the from the first generation of artists that came in to work with us, it became an art school where we we were working together, learning from each other, and also getting to interface with different types of institutions that I felt like before a lot of people weren't getting the chance to interface with like museums or Mm. whatever other types of institutions there were right and we were able to interface with these things and because yeah, once you start like connecting with those things you you see how things could be possible possible where at first you're like oh i'll never be in these institutions or whatever yeah. and all of a sudden you start to interact with people and you're like oh well it's really not that far yeah <laughs> it's the, right the there. world gets smaller yeah i always say that art the art community is like one sep one degree separation like mm. if you hear the six degrees of separation mm -hmm. in the regular world i think the art community is like one because to stay wow. in it you got to be fucking insane <laughs> 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 so so like by the time you get uh, to like a certain level bro like yeah. everybody else has dropped out yeah. and like if you're still you're, in you're, it. You're, and so right now my and future you've been is, in it for a long time bro, bro. My, 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 <laughs> my future is right now my goal is anything i want to happen should be only one phone call away yeah if the, if oh, that's the, beautiful if, if the, the world is getting smaller and smaller yeah. and i've been able to like uh 
You're, you're talking to the Smithsonian, my brother. Pr so. Proof of like my wherewithal yeah. to keep doing it. Like yeah. it, like if I want to get something done, I should be able to be like one phone call away. Yeah. I also want to get rid of for myself what I've been calling the brown ceiling. Mm. And the brown ceiling is like so if it's related to the glass ceiling, the glass ceiling is the invisible ceiling mm -hmm. that people put in place for you so you can't pass it, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. They keep you in your place. But the brown ceiling, bro, is the bullshit we put there ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I've also put a lot of bullshit mm -hmm. above me that mm -hmm. is keeping me from excelling or pushing forward mm -hmm. into what mm -hmm. I want to see as a vision. It's a constant struggle, bro. It's a constant struggle to be maintaining that because yeah. I'm like, oh, this thing, oh, <clears throat> fuck that fool, oh, there's people, oh, they, yeah. there's people do, oh, they think of me like this. But that's all my own bullshit. Yeah. Like, I need to grow past that and mature past that. So when I'm making these phone calls, my one phone call to get to, get to things done, I don't have all these up bullshit little barriers. Mm -hmm. I, I could just be confident in it. I could be understanding that, yeah, like I deserve this place at the table. Like I deserve uh, what the things are that are going to be coming my way. And I need to be uh, not fearful about mm -hmm. asking up for them and, you know, and saying that, hey, this is what I need. This is what I need to happen. This is mm -hmm. who I need it to happen with. And uh, and getting back on track for that. Like that's personally for me because Thank I feel like for those words, I yeah. want to be um, – <clears throat> You know, I want to be that person that 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 people could come to and like you. Oh, that problem ain't shit. You're that's one phone call away. Yeah. Like, let's get that shit done. Yeah. Not just for me, but for other folks no, for around other me. People always. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so I feel like maybe that's why I've been able to navigate all these different worlds, so that I could be a person that could help sew all that stuff together, yeah. so that people are coming from. We're connectors, like we connect. Yeah, a lot of people, we're connectors, yeah. bro. And I, I feel like that's what I would like to be. And if for language, I mean, I want to develop a a formal initiative called slang you mm. or slanguage university That's and cool. where we could develop with young people or students of any age you know mostly adults i think at this point mm. because there's a lot of programs for kids and there's mm. a lot of programs for youth but i think like artists you know adult artists not adult industry artists but like adult <laughs> artists <laughs> that i need to get together and talk about but we stuff. won't tell them they can't come they no can come they can too. come too because yeah, right. they have money yeah, yeah. so they, <laughs> they, they could they could we could we could be like they could be a gallery named after them yeah, we don't mind course, yeah. the ron jeremy uh gallery, gallery we yeah. don't care <laughs> but uh, um yeah we would like to be able to pr bring together a space where uh you know we could have open-ended conversations mm. like this what i'm just saying even though i'm yeah. just joking because things are at a point right now where uh People have a lot to say, but there's no institutional uh, support for those things being said. Yeah. And uh, how can they be free, free to uh, support each other's ideas, uh, talk to each other, learn from each other, learn from professors or learn oh, not professors? Well, I don't want it to be like top down learning. I would rather it be lateral learning yeah. where people are kind of teaching each other and working together to make stuff. But I think uh, Slanguage University is a project that I'm going to kind of really head into 2022 because right now, like besides language and all the stuff we've been able to do, like we've been able to sell artists to like master's degrees at Yale Damn. and stuff like that at this point. And I feel like with the community that we've started to build and what we're going to build into the future, um, I would like, I would like to leave a kind of legacy like that, you know, cause I'm not going to be here forever. And, uh, and I don't even want to be around language forever. I want to train the new generation to take that shit over yeah, and do what they want to they do what they need to do with it. Make soldiers. Yeah. And, um, and I can, I could, you know, focus on my drawing or my <laughs> installations that, <laughs> but installations give you a headache, bro. I'm done. Well, well I'm gonna take a break <laughs> with that. All that said, and those are great words to end with. Thank you so much to the homie, the scholar, <laughs> the intelligent, the man from the streets and the man from the art world and the man from everywhere around the world. I just want to ask you the final question um, is if you could answer in one sentence, if you could give this advice to anybody, if they were wondering how you did it, how do you do it? Mario Ibarra, how do you do it? How I do it is that I facilitate, not player hate. Show. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank and, you, Rafa. Uh, thank you to our sponsor, movitajuicebar.com. Don't forget to check them out too. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>